Uh, welcome all of you for our history photography series. This is chapter 12 of the ongoing series. We're thrilled to have Ann Mitchell tonight as our keynote speaker. We'll be talking about the notable and influential women photographers uh, throughout the history of photography. Uh, our next chapter on this series uh, will be street photography on April 5th, now presented, presented by Thomas Alleman. Uh, Ann Mitchell, I've known for many, many years, uh, just a wonderful, wonderful person, a terrific artist, uh, amazing educator. Uh, Ann has a, a list of credits that I would like to read uh, so I can officially introduce her properly. Uh, Ann is an artist who uses photography to explore space and place, actively engaged in creating worlds of poetic experience. After completing a BFA in photography from Art Center College of Design, she worked as an award-winning advertising and editorial photographer for over a decade. She then returned to school to complete an MFA in art from Claremont Graduate University. While there, in addition to producing her own work, uh, she also curated several large art projects and has continued that commitment to community through the organization of photo-related events. After graduation, she joined the art department at Long Beach City College where she taught for over two decades, hosting multiple visual media festivals, served as chair and as digital media program coordinator. In 2020, Anne transitioned into being an actively practicing full-time artist while continuing to teach through workshops, curation, and individual tutoring. Her photographs have been included in a large number of solo and group exhibitions in the United States and internationally, and have been featured in numerous exhibitions and publications. In 2008, Balcony Press released Austin Valverde Impressions of Montecito Masterpiece, a monograph of her Valverde project. She continues to teach and pursue her photographic interest and in her most recent series, The Chance Chronicles, a photo montage set of platinum, palladium, dreamscapes. And with that, I would like to officially welcome and hand the floor over to our presenter, Ann Mitchell. Well, thank you so much. That, uh, that was quite a, uh, wow, who is that person? Um, I especially like the part where after, I, instead of retiring, I transitioned because uh, I didn't want to use the R word. So, but, well, transition sounds good. Okay, well, uh, I want to thank LACP for giving me this opportunity. And I want to thank all of you who are attending um, I am approaching this as an artist, not a historian. And I already warned my mom, who is an art historian, that, yeah, if somebody asks some question, I'm just shoveling it off to you. So she can deal with anything that's really uh, art historian based. So um, I, my goal here in this talk is to kind of enlarge um, the group of women that you already know. So I'm not gonna talk about Julia Margaret Cameron because she's been talked about a lot. Um, and that tends to be you know, the person that everybody knows. So I'm gonna try, uh, what I tried to do was look for people who uh, maybe have been overlooked. Speaking of which, there's a wonderful obituary series in the New York Times called Overlooked. Uh, and it actually like has all these really interesting people in it. Um, so this is just a selection. Obviously, I kept trying to lock down the talk and then I'd like do some more research and there'd be new people. So it really, um, I really see this as a celebration of women photographers and artists. And I thought what I'd like to do at the very end, what they were talking about in terms of the participation and maybe so during the, and I'm not gonna put you on the spot, but over the course of the, of the talk, maybe you could make a note of somebody that was somebody, I mean, it could be somebody that you know, that you studied with, um, but somebody that you think we might not know of um, and just a really short, uh, like, what was it about them? And I thought we'd just all put it in the chat. And I love the thought, this is me at the very end. And I love the thought that at the end, the chat is just gonna explode with all these fabulous women uh, photographers. And we'll have, you know, that'll be a wonderful way to kind of 
end the evening with all that energy. Okay, so let's get this thing started. So um, the way that I've organized it is in three um, time periods. And in each time period, I'll talk a little bit about maybe some trends and also um, a timeline aspect. Um, photography, because it has this mechanical aspect to it, has had a lot of gatekeeping elements, which means that the buy-in, you, you needed more than just a pencil. Um, so the buy-in was quite difficult. And I was having a very interesting discussion this weekend. And uh, the woman who had previously taught history of photography said, all these guys were just rich. Um, so the early stuff, you kind of had to be a scientist and a rich scientist. So we'll talk a little bit. Um, so I will kind of in each section touch on that idea of gatekeeping. So um, first two terms then, mechanical drawing. So the first one area we're looking at is 1840s to 1920s. And I'm starting at 1840s instead of 1830s or 20s uh, because it's when women first started. Actually, I should make that 30. Okay, just ignore that part. Um, so initially it was talked of as a mechanical process. So mechanical drawing. Um, as we get towards the later part of this time period, there is a real push uh, to think of photography as a fine art and as a creative expression. And in the UK, that was called the linked ring. And in the US, that was called the photo succession. Our timeline, I am really thrilled to say that it was a woman that got this ball rolling. So in 1794, a Scottish chemist, Elizabeth Fulham, actually published research on light sensitive salts. And that really got other scientists working in terms of the process. So we actually were there right at the beginning. 1826, we've got the first scene, photo of a real life scene. Then we come into the 1830s uh, to 1850s, which is a tremendous explosion of photography. We've got daguerreotypes, ambrotypes, tintypes. And the problem actually with those three are that they are one ofs. So the thing that you take is the original. Then we get into printmaking. So with albumin, you're taking this glass negative and you're able to now make reproductions of those. But it was still a very popular thing. By 1850s, there were literally hundreds of daguerreotype studios in New York alone. So it really was something that everybody was just taken with. 1888, Kodak induce, introduces the first roll film cameras. Um, these were, I have a little picture of it there. So for $25, you got this little roll film. It would, came loaded. It took a hundred shots and then you sent it off to be printed. Now that was another $10. So that's $35, which, you know, back then was actually quite a bit of money. But if you think that, well, maybe you could sell the different prints, it still is starting to, the gatekeeping aspect is opening up a little bit. Just after the turn of the century, we get our first color process. Um, autochromes become very popular. And um, 1912, Kodak releases the best pocket camera which actually is quite enormous. So I'm not sure whose best that would be. If we look at then the first photos taken by women, we have, it's interesting. They're actually, both of these women are listed as having taken the first photo, which is why you can't trust the internet. We've got Sarah Ann Bright, and she took the image that's on the right on the top. Um, and it's called the leaf. And what's interesting is I was looking through um, some auction records and this image or this photo, the actual original, when it was attributed to Henry Fox Talbot, it was worth a lot of money. They then more recently have realized that it was misattributed and actually it was taken by Sarah Ann Bright and all of a sudden the price crashed. So. I don't know what's with these people. 
The one on the bottom was done by Constance Fox Talbot. And if you know anything about photo uh, history of photography, she is the wife of Henry. And she wrote to him, I have composed a little frame with the first four lines of The Last Rose of Summer, which was a poem by a friend, Thomas Moore. And it is now waiting for brighter weather. Um, photography was done outside in the sun. Um, and so this is also listed as the first photo taken by a woman. And while she did work as his assistant, she really, I don't think, identified herself as a photographer. She wasn't that interested in it. But the rest of the Talbot women actually were very active and quite interested in it. So my first um, big surprise when I was researching this, I had always been told that the pencil of nature was the first photo book but it turns out it wasn't. So actually, and this sounds horrible, it's photographs of British algae. It's not actually algae, it's botanical specimens, um, cyanotype impressions. So this was done by Anna Atkins, who actually did the first photo-based book. And um, she was a botanist, and you're gonna find that most of the really early practitioners had a science background. Uh, her father had been using and interested in the cyanotype process, but he'd been using it for things like prints, uh, like you know, building plans, we think of them now as blueprints. And so she started experimenting and really kind of expanded um, what could be done with them. And so the first book was actually uh, three volumes and to make it even more impressive. So she did this whole thing. Now, the second part of it was actually done with a friend and colleague, Anna Dixon. Um, the second part, so she made 17 copies. This was a three volume book, 17 copies, hand bound, 14 pages of text, 389 pages of botanical specimens. 389, multiply that by 17. Um, so she has this lovely quote, and she had previously, she used to sketch these, but she really liked the precision of photography. But she says, I have lately taken in hand a rather lengthy performance, taking photographic impressions of all I can procure of these ferns many of which are so minute that accurate drawings are difficult to make. So, and you can see if you look at the uh, right hand side, you can see that she wasn't, we tend to, when we make um, uh, these sun prints, we tend to put a sheet of glass over it, which presses everything flat. And you can see that these are actually raised off of the paper a little bit, which is why several of them are a little softer. But um, so the, the uh, fine print in terms of, if you look at when they do talk about the pencil of nature, which is the Henry Fox Talbot book, they say that that was the first commercial one because she did not sell hers. She actually gave them away to colleagues and people that she admired. So that's the fine print on that one. But as far as I'm concerned, we have it. Okay. So the first, uh, the second woman I'm gonna talk about was actually uh, recommended to me by my mom. And I think she was really correct. So this is Frances Benjamin Johnson. And what we're looking at right now is a self portrait. She called it the new woman. This is 1896. And there's certain things here that are extremely shocking. So. She has her skirt hiked up, just even the way her leg is crossed over the knee. We're seeing her stockings, we're seeing her petticoats. She's got a stein of beer, she's got a cigarette. And um, you know, all of these things are really quite shocking. The part I really love too, is that on the fireplace behind her then, she's got these six portraits of men. And I, you know, further research would bring out who they are, but you can see already that she um, 
you know, really brought a, an interesting energy to it. She was, this is another self-portrait. Um, so she was in many ways kind of the first celebrity, uh, a, a photographer of celebrities, um, sort of a little bit of the Annie Leibowitz of her time. Uh, in 1890, she opened this photo studio in Washington. It was the only one, she's the only woman listed uh, to have a studio at that time. And right away started getting commissions from several publications. Because they're located in Washington, she had great access to celebrities. She photographed five presidents. Um, uh, and here we have on the left-hand side, we have Susan B. Anthony. Um, uh, Johnson was very active in the uh, movement for the vote. We have on the right-hand side, George Washington Carver. Uh, Benjamin was also a strong advocate for other women photographers. And that was part of what I really liked about her. In 1897, she wrote an article for Ladies Home Journal called What a Woman Can Do with a Camera. And it was great. It was encouraging other women. This is a good paying job. Here's what you can do with it. A couple years later, um, she did another uh, series for them called The Foremost Women Photographers in America. And she actually helped them find, it was herself and these six other ones. Um, she, at the turn of the century, was uh, a delegate to the International Congress of Photography in Paris, at which she curated an exhibition of 28 women that then went on to travel to Russia. Uh, and in 1930, she was the first woman to ever have an exhibition of her work at the Library of Congress. But what she's known for significantly is her work in uh, photographing historic black colleges. So she received a commission to photograph the Hampton Normal Agricultural Institute in Virginia, which is now known as Hampton University. And it had been established in 1868 to instruct newly freed slaves of the South to give them jobs, um, literacy, and it was co-educational and it was residential. So um, it was really considered a step up. And the film that she was using was so slow that the students actually had to pose and hold still while she took the photographs. But Booker T. Washington was so impressed by the work that she had done at Hamilton that he asked her to do the same for Tuskegee. And while she was there, she was actually, she and a group of uh, black men were actually attacked and chased by uh, a vigilante group and just narrowly escaped death. Um, and so here are some of the additional ones from that, uh, from that album we have. So they learned agricultural skills. This is an example, one of the homes that the students lived in. Here we have the idea of uh, the old farming versus new farming methods. And in the 60s, uh, John Sarkowski at MoMA uh, re-released the Hampton album and it's really quite a beautiful uh, book. There's her, her self-portrait again. And um, her, in her later years, she became very interested in documenting um, Southern antebellum architecture uh, and did a lot of documentation of that, which it turned out to be good because much of that architecture has since been destroyed. And here she is in the late 30s uh, with her assistant. And there she is with that. It looks to me like an eight by 10. I like to think that she got there on the motorcycle, but, um, but that's just me. So you can see she's still got a strong spirit. The next photographer that I'm gonna talk about is Marie Hogue and her uh, partner, um, Bolette Berg. Together, they opened up a photo studio in Horten, Norway, and they were able to make a, a pretty good living on it. Um, most of these individual studios made a living doing portraits, 
remembrances, celebrations. She, they sold uh, landscapes, cityscapes, decorative. Uh, she was very outgoing. She was a member of the National Association for Women's Right to Vote. But what we're gonna look at just briefly is a group of, so at, quite a bit after her death, this museum in Norway received uh, 440 of her glass negatives. Some of them were actually put off to the side and labeled private. Well, they have gone ahead and scanned and distributed those. And there's an interesting dialogue then about the ethics of doing that. Um, and what we're looking at would have been private. They would never have been distributed. So, um, so she uh, has, uh, so this is actually a self-portrait of her with mustache. And what drew me to her was, I just adore this one on the left-hand side. You know, you don't see that. When you, when you think of historic imagery, you, you know, everybody's prim and proper and, you know, and here she is in her woolen underwear and, you know, I think she's cutting her hair herself because I've now learned how to cut my hair, you know, and she looks like she's just got a lot of, a lot of great energy. Um, and I just really loved, I loved the um, kind of self-confidence. Here she is then in a portrait with, uh, I don't know who the gentleman is on the, on the other side, but kind of experimenting then with cross-dressing. Uh, this is her partner and companion, Bolette. And I think if you look closely, uh, you can see between them, their dog. And I think maybe the white cord is actually their cable release. And that's how they're taking the photo, but they're smoking. Um, here it's, they're sitting on the floor, they're drinking, they're card playing, all the things that nice girls weren't supposed to do. And she would be the one sitting up front. Um, and so, it, so it is interesting to kind of think about, you know, does this person still have, you know, do, should we respect it? Um, should we respect their desire for these images to be private? On the other hand, their images really can be inspirational and, and they really show this just terrific energy. I really loved this one. And I, you know, it makes me think of Cindy Sherman with her um, you know, created narratives. Um, here we've got, you know, there's a gun and there's, uh, it looks like there was a lockbox and maybe a robbery. The other thing that I really like about it is kind of breaking the fourth wall. I don't know if that's the right metaphor, but this idea of we are seeing the backdrop, the edge of the backdrop. And it really reminds me of an interesting series that Sarah Moon did, I think it was in the 1980s, uh, Little Red Riding Hood, where she shot it in this kind of alley and, and we see the sea stands and we see the backdrop. Um, but there's a freshness and uh, an ability to, you know, to really connect with it that we don't normally see. And here's a last few portraits, pretty cute dog. Um, then the last way that I was thinking about from this time period is, so for, you know, since, since it took a lot of money to have the equipment, to have a studio, and a lot of people couldn't do that, then how did women choose to have themselves represented when they went to have their photos taken? Because that became a very popular thing. And I was really taken by this. This is a uh, misspelled tintype as I'm looking at the caption. Um, this is a tintype which is less expensive, more affordable than a daguerreotype actually recently purchased by the um, International Center of Photography. And we see this woman with her hair loosened, which, you know, you would never do that in public. And so we see women uh, being more playful, kind of breaking, you know, subverting their class. Uh, and so I think the way that they chose to present themselves also says something about women. And in a way, it's their version of a selfie. 
we have the idea of the carte de visit, which is where you would go and you'd have multiple setups where you'd dress up, you'd pretend to be different things, different people, and then you'd get these cards. And when you would visit your friends, it's like Pokemon, you know, you'd trade cards with them uh, and you could collect all your friends. The other impact of, uh, of having this record from this time is that it allows for, uh, for a voice. It allows for people to reclaim um, a past that has been often stolen from them. And so we see that um, you can reclaim your history. There's a great quote from um, Deborah Willis, who is the uh, head of photography and imaging at Tisch New York, who's also an artist and a photographer. She says, we see beauty, we see fashion, we see these multi-dimensional experiences of black men and women during that time period. So it allows for an underrepresented stereotype uh, group to actually experience and reclaim their history. This is the five officers of the Women's League in Newport, Rhode Island. And then I thought it would be interesting, while you do very often see um, colorizing or tinting of images at this time, um, it looks very artificial. And so um, this is a photographer, a retoucher, who actually kind of um, does it in a contemporary mode. And I thought it was really interesting because I'm looking at her going, I know this woman. And you know, then of course, well, I can't because she's older than my grandmother. But it, it does help you kind of make that connection from, uh, you know, from who these people really were and give you that sense of the living, living people behind those daguerreotypes. Okay, so now we're at the turn of the century and photography is continuing in popularity. This was the first LACP in a way. So this is the first Los Angeles Photographic Salon of 1902. And um, they had, I'd say about 30 to 40% of them were women. So there was a pretty good representation. By and large, most of the types of subjects that they were doing you know, were fairly kind of stereotyped as what women might take. Uh, this is Annie Brigman. We'll be looking at her work in just a bit. Uh, but it was still very interesting to kind of see such a great representation. We also, as we come into the 1900s, we get the use of color imagery. Um, Sarah and Angelina, Angelina Ackland, uh, on the left-hand side, this is the Sanger Shepherd process. That was 1903. And over on the right side, actually, the autochrome uh, by uh, Helen Messenger Murdoch, which ended up kind of wiping out many of those other processes. Um, and this was 1914. This is in Egypt. And you can see, I always love seeing the shadow of the photographer. So over on the left-hand side of that image, you can see her with her tripod. And she was actually 51 when she took this image, hauling her stuff around. Okay, so speaking of Anne Brigman. Uh, so Annie Brigman uh, is noted as she was a poet, a critic. Uh, she was uh, adhered to the arts and crafts philosophy. And she was a member of the pictorialist uh, movement, which is this idea of bringing back the mark of the hand, moving away from photography just being this mechanical process. Um, before I talk more about her work, I just wanted to briefly show you this in terms of, so this could be issues with finding images online, which who knows how people are scanning them, but so the, these are both listed as silver gelatin prints. The one on the, I believe the one on the left is the Getty owns that, the one on the right, the Smithsonian does. We have 1914 and 1918. And um, that is, so it's interesting. So one of the interesting things about when you can make prints is it gives the artist then 
room and time to start deciding how they want to change the voice that they're sending out into the world. And you can see that the second one becomes much more dramatic, that we're losing much of the detail. And as I said, I don't know if that is representative of the real thing um, or if it's you know, just a bad scam. So uh, what was kind of revolutionary uh, with her work at the time is we're very used to, in our time, seeing the nude in the landscape, but 99% of the time, it's a, a male gaze that's doing that. So it was very unusual to do a nude uh, much less, and then even more unusual to have you be the nude. So these are in most of the cases, she is the model in these. And then when you add the fact that she was doing nudes in the landscape, so outside in the wild, it really you know, was uh, positively unheard of. So um, there's this real sense of um, connection and creation, this love of nature. To me, this almost reminds me of, I think it's, Daphne, the nymph that is being chased by Apollo, and she calls to the heavens, you know, and, and the heavens save her by turning her into a tree. So she has this real interest, and that is that all kind of goes with the uh, pictorialist ideal. So very romantic, very texturized. Now, this we're coming into, uh, I believe this is, I can't see because the the, um, the little bar is over where my caption is, but I believe this has been in the 20s. And as we move with her work into the 20s and 30s, you start to see it's still romantic, but it's not quite as textured. It's not quite as, um, as uh, involved with the surface of it. And here, this one is in the 30s, and we're really starting to move then into a modernist uh, time period where little cleaner lines. She also worked in color. So this is a, a, a very early autochrome, which actually is a beautiful process. So now we're moving into the second section and this would be the 1920s to 50s. And in terms of trends, so we saw how with Annie Brigman's work, it started to become less textured, less heavily romantic. And you also uh, start to see the city. Um, and part of that then is this movement of straight photography and modernism, uh, where we are looking at what do cameras do? Well, cameras focus and they have depth of field and, they, uh, and they're sharp. So all of those kinds of things combined with um, this interest. So if you think about the 1920s, we're just coming out of World War I, which was a war that started on horseback and ended in skies and airplanes. So there's this real industrialization and an interest in it. We have the rise of independent studios, more and more people opening up uh, studios. We also have a rise in interest in fine art and in photojournalism. In terms of timeline, we've got uh, in the 20s, the invention of the flash lamp, in the 40s, color negative film, uh, and close to the 60s, we've got the um, uh, 35 millimeter SLR, which the big issue there is that that's a camera that you look through. Um, it's almost like this, it's like this wall between you and the subject, almost like a, like a little safety box that you're in, as opposed to looking down if you're doing a twin lens or, you know, really being very static um, with a, uh, a larger camera. The first photographer that I'm going to talk about is Floristine Peralt Collins, and she was one of the first professional African-American photographers. She had her studio and she lived in Louisiana, specifically New Orleans. And she got her start in photography pretty early. At, uh, at 14 years of age, she started assisting local photographers. Now, unfortunately, to be able to be hired by those photographers, 
she had to pass for white. Uh, but she was able to get her training and very soon she opened up a studio in her home uh, and she was able to support her family through the Great Depression by her work with her studio. These are uh, several people. Um, this is actually the steps of her studio. You can actually see over on the left-hand side, little photographs, examples of the kinds of photos that you could have taken. Um, so she ended up uh, in the 30s, then she moved her studio out of her home into uh, what's called South Rampart Street, which was the Black Business District of New Orleans. And she was there for 30 years uh, documenting uh, African-American life uh, and kind of really showing, putting lie to the stereotype. So this is a family friend getting ready for Mardi Gras. This is the 40s. Here we have uh, hand tinting. So this was, if you wanted color, you were going to have to put it in there yourself at this point. And it's interesting that the color has actually lasted so long. Uh, but the work of a, uh, of a community portrait studio is you're shooting everything from babies to young men. This was, uh, this man uh, was, uh, the date on this was 1942. So he had probably just recently enlisted. Uh, and I am happy to say that he did come back safe because he had allowed use of this photo, not to me, uh, but to their foundation. Um, as an older gentleman. So it's nice to know he made it back safely. And, um, and we actually have a local connection to this photographer. So um, her great niece is actually a professor, or they is a professor at Occidental. And in 2012, she put together a book of her uh, great aunt's work. It's called Picturing Black New Orleans a Creole photographer's view of the early 20th century. And it, in her words, it blends her story with the photographs showing changes in the lives of Louisiana Creoles and African-Americans. Okay, our next photographer then is Dora Marr. And, um, she is somehow sometimes overshadowed by her relationship with Picasso as his uh, companion and muse for a while. But as an artist, she was definitely um, very successful and very interesting. And I was really taken by this self-portrait. Um, you know, I, I really kind of, all of these lines that she has going and also that she's kind of placed herself behind this lamp and it, or this, um, what do we call that? We call it a fan, there we go. My brain's just gone on vacation. And um, at first I had thought, well, maybe she has the camera back there, but then I'm thinking actually, I think her, I see her fingers on the camera right at the bottom part of the mirror. But I, you know, you have this sense of this person kind of almost in case they're, they're literally framed. Uh, and literally behind bars. But you, what you can see on this also too, is you can start to see her intrusion into the surface of the uh, print. Um, so she was very interested in experimental work. She, uh, in 1930s, she opened a studio in Paris, specializing in portraits, nudes, fashion, and advertising. Um, and she was very connected to the surrealists. Um, she continued to be a, a, an experimenter in the dark room. So she would make prints, she'd cut them up, she'd re, uh, you know, put them back together, repurpose them. Um, with this one, you can even see that she's gone so far as uh, the reason that this, uh, that the lines there are shifted is that she has actually moved the, um, so the paper is not sitting flat under the enlarger, which is why you're getting this distortion. And then she's um, going in and painting it. Uh, so she continued to be a, an experimenter. And I've always thought, I, I've always loved this image and I've actually seen this image uh, ripped off in many cases. 
Um, now, much has been made that at the end of uh, her relationship with Picasso, that she was distraught and nothing ever happened. Well, that's not really true. So while she did kind of step back from the artist group that she was a part of, she continued to be a painter. And in the 80s, she actually returned to photography and started making cameraless photos. She would tamper with the negatives. She'd scratch them. She'd corrode them with acid. She'd paint on them. So she actually stayed very active um, for the rest of her life. I uh, was very taken with this image. So this is 1936. And to me, it has shades. Now, part of it, there's this real timeless quality. And part of that may be that because it's a nude, you know, we're not locked into thinking to, you know, saying, oh, those clothes look old fashioned or whatever. But there's something about this that just I find really interesting, this idea. I don't know if this person is in the midst of an action, if they're posing, I love the way the sun comes in uh, and hits them, but it has a very contemporary quality to it. It even the pose, although it's, uh, it, the pose actually reminds me of a Cindy Sherman photo, although that one, um, I think she's turned around and facing the camera, but, um, but yeah, so 1936. And I actually had that experience many times uh, when I was looking through the work. Um, the next photographer is Claude Cae, and I think I am, you know, the French always get me when it comes to pronunciation, um, who was born uh, Lucy Schwab, uh, but um, was a French surrealist photographer, sculptor, and writer. Um, by 18, she was already making um, these very, at times, androgynous um, portraits of herself, which was kind of very unheard of at that time. This one is, what do you want from me? So, you know, collaging, marking on the work. Um, she, this quote from her is masculine, feminine. It depends on the situation. Neuter is the only gender that always suits me. She was very active in the Surrealist movement and she very often showed with the Surrealist um, uh, painters. Uh, uh, but this whole series of self-portraits I found very interesting. Uh, here is actually a photo that she had taken. This is uh, Sheila Legg who is a surrealist performance artist. And uh, this was taken in Trafalgar Square. Uh, and the photo and the series from them uh, was used in many publications. The dress is actually based on a Salvador Dali uh, painting. And so her head has been transformed into this mass of flowers. Now, um, both uh, Claude and her uh, partner, who um, uh, used the pen name of Marcel Moore, were very active also in the French resistance. So we're talking, these are the late uh, 1930s. So in 1937, she moved to uh, Jersey Island, which is a, um, which is just off of you might know it from uh, Mont Saint-Michel. So it's in between the French and the English uh, coast. And, uh, but they were very active uh, in their resistance and were actually captured in 1944 and sentenced to death by the Nazis. And fortunately the war ended and they were saved. So she continued to make self-portraits until her death, and she said, under this mask, another mask, I will never be finished removing all these faces. Okay, our next photographer is Lola Alvarez Bravo. And, oh my God, I better talk faster. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, who was uh, one of the first Mexican female photographers. She was an art teacher, a curator, a film director, a gallery owner, and of course, an artist. In 1925, she married um, uh, uh, Manuel Alvarez Bravo and took his name. 
And a few years later, they opened a gallery in their home. Their cultural set included Frida Kahlo, Diego Rivera, Maria Izquierdo, and she assisted him uh, in, his, in the darkroom, helping him to make prints, but very quickly started to want to make her own work, which did not go over well with him. And within a few years, their marriage ended. And she was very inspired by Tina Madotti and this idea of, um, you know, of looking at shapes in this kind of clean presentation. Um, she was good friends with Frida Kahlo and in her later years, Bravo's later years, um, she opened a gallery um, and gave Kahlo her first and only solo exhibition in Mexico during her lifetime. And um, continued to make work right till the end. One of the things I thought about when I was um, thinking about who, to, you know, how to approach this was this idea of what do women bring to the party? What is it about us? Is there something? And, and that becomes a loaded question because that can also be used against you. But I do think that there can be a different relationship perhaps with, the, with your subject. And so in this case, it did make me think, well, I wonder, you know, the way this child is looking, you know, I really wondered, would the child have felt as comfortable with a male uh, photographer? It's hard to say, but I was very taken by this image. Our next uh, photographer is Suniko Sasamoto, and she was one of Japan's first professional photojournalists, female photojournalists. This image was not taken by her. Um, but her essence was really about, there's this great interview with her and she, I think is actually still alive and she's like 107 and still, you know, still going strong. And she was saying, you know, I didn't know what to do as a photographer, but I thought of Margaret Burke White and I thought, well, I can just be Margaret Burke White. Uh, and so that was kind of how she, how she got started. Now, Oddly enough, they actually, uh, they, she was required to wear heels and dresses every time she worked. So certain traditions didn't die. But the essence of her work then is really exploring what was happening in Japan post-World War II with the rise of uh, Western influence. And so here you see, um, you see uh, everybody wearing, so definitely the woman, wearing uh, a Western garb. And you also see them the Tokyo PX, which would be um, uh, because of the American army base at that point. Uh, so she continued to photograph events, um, celebrities, looking at Japanese culture. This is a geisha school. Um, even simple things like this. So, this is the, this ship has a really interesting history. It was built in 1938 and was used in the war, but then after the war, it um, was used to repatriate Japanese um, uh, citizens who were living in former Japanese colonies. So that brought them home. Then it became an Arctic research center. And weirdly enough, so it was involved in rescuing a group of scientists who had gotten trapped and their lives had been saved by their um, sled dogs. Unfortunately, there was only room when they finally got through the ice, there was only room for the humans and not the dogs. So they leave the dogs there. And when they came back, Two of the dogs were still alive and still had managed to survive like six months in the Arctic. And so very strangely enough, this was taken, the whole world was taken by this. And actually Disney made a movie with Paul Walker um, called Eight Below. Uh, but in that one, all the dogs lived, I think, you know, cause that's Disney. Uh, but so she continued to photograph um, journalists, writers, um, this is a, a politician who was a real advocate of socialism in post-war Japan. 
um, unfortunately, also noted for being assassinated on camera. There's a very famous photo, not taken by her, of, um, of the assailant and because he was stopped in going for the second blow. Okay, our next photographer is Lisa Lott Grishabina. And um, she was born in Germany. Um, and you can see her early training. This reminds me a little bit of the Anna Atkins work. Um, and uh, this is 1929. You see the experimentation that's happening. There was a lot of that in the 20s and 30s. Oh, here we have this overlay of lace. Um, I love this one, then it's got a little bit of the surrealist aspect to it. And fortunately for her, she and her family, uh, they were Jewish and they um, immigrated to Palestine in 1934, where she immediately opened up a photo studio in Tel Aviv. And it's interesting, there was a whole series of images uh, called under the category of light athletics. And you can kind of almost see like this Lini Riefenstahl sort of uh, aspect to the, to the body. But if you think about it in terms of how uh, people had been portrayed in Germany, you know, there was this real drive to portray this strong and able body. Um, she ended up giving up photography at about the 1960s. And her family really wasn't that connected with it or aware of it. And after she died, her son was clearing out a cupboard and came upon this whole huge stack of negatives and figured nobody's ever gonna want this. And so he threw them all away. Uh, but fortunately, uh, a curator was able to intercede. And it was unclear to me if they got the negatives or if they just got the prints. And so the, the prints ended up being donated to the Israel Museum in Jerusalem, and these were from the exhibition. Okay, our next photographer then is Humai Verawala, and um, she was actually one of my favorites. She had kind of a really interesting spirit to her. So she was one of India's first female photographers, and her early work uh, was you know, just taken from daily life um, in, in India. These are from her college days. And as a uh, working photographer, you were kind of sent out to shoot anything. So we've got a new nursing school open. Let's, let's watch what they do for relaxation. Here we are at a fox hunt um, in uh, New Delhi. Now, in 1940, she moved to Delhi, and um, it was said that she was often seen biking around town with her camera strapped to her back. And she basically, almost immediately, and from 1940 to 1970, she worked for the British Information Services. And she said, um, I could go to sensitive areas and no one would stop me. Uh, they didn't take me seriously. And uh, they thought I was just fooling around. So it gave her great access. She also then uh, got, to show, got to document the transition of India from being a colony into an independent st state. And this is one of the first independence days. She photographed all kinds of celebrities. This was uh, Mahatma Gandhi. This was when they were going to, um, discuss the uh, annexing um, and division of the state. One of the things she lists as her, as her greatest regret is that she was not there during the assassination, that she was on her way to it when she got a call to go back to another job. And so um, that was her biggest regret having missed that. Um, this is during the funeral procession. Uh, one of her favorite subjects was Nehru, and this is him releasing a dove as a sign of peace. Um, she said that when he died, she cried and hid her face from the other photographers. This is him 
lighting a British diplomat's wife's cigarette. But she photographed, this is also him later on as prime minister. She photographed many notables, Martin Luther King and his wife, Coretta Scott, uh, the Dalai Lama. And this is actually my favorite photo, not taken of uh, by her, but um, so in 1970, she ended up quitting photography. Um, it had changed when Indira Gandhi came to power, she changed the access and removed access for, uh, it used to be you could go anywhere. And by corralling what could happen and when photographers had access, it kind of really changed the, um, the energy of the scene. And she said, uh, it's not worth it anymore. We used to have rules. We followed a dress code, treated each other with respect. Now they're only interested in money and I don't want to be part of the crowd. But I feel like this one shows that she could definitely handle herself in a crowd. Okay, now we go to the 60s to 90s, which is our last section. It was hard to decide. It's very hard to decide that you can put yourself in a, in a, uh, your time period in a lecture on history. It's like, oh my God, I've become historic. So, uh, so here we are the 1960s to 90s and the trends that you find there. So you've got these two different sort of paths happening. You have photographers who are being trained as photographers. Many of them at that time actually had gotten their training in the military and then they came out and either opened up businesses. Many of them actually became university and college uh, teachers versus artists who were working with photographic materials. So they weren't necessarily respecting the rules, but they were enlarging what could be done with it. There's a real rise in the popularity of street photography, but at the same time, there's a real interest in constructed images and studio work. A lot of documentation and documentary work coming out of um, you know, life and book magazines. And then feminism also had a strong effect on art making at that time. In terms of the technical, the gatekeeping aspect of photography had really dropped. Cameras were lighter, lenses were lighter, films were faster. Um, there were more labs to drop stuff off. Um, there was autofocus, auto exposure, um, and there was a, a pretty broad range of classes uh, and access to training. Uh, the first photographer I'm going to talk about is Ichiuchi, Ichi, Ichiuchi Miyako. Apologies. Um, and so now we're in the 70s in Japan, which is, was the photography uh, area was very male dominated and very traditionalist. And so she really caused quite a shock um, with her work. She had grown up in Yokosuka, which was the, uh, a small town, well, not a small town, but a town that had uh, the largest American naval base in post-war uh, on the Pacific. And one thing I had, and I mean, we hear about there being American naval bases, but what we don't really think about is the fact that this is being an occupation, an ocu uh, an op you're occupying this town, you are changing its dynamics. And um, so she, it was a situation where she really couldn't wait to get away. So she very early on went to school, art school in Tokyo in the 60s. And the dialogues that was happening at that point was really about identity politics, um, self-expression, and really thinking about that, she started to go back to her roots and, and kind of revisit where she had grown up. And so the other thing too that I forgot to, to mention a big change in this section of time is that I feel that artists are tending to work more in bodies of work that are, are rather discreet. There is also a greater um, explosion of interest in publishing photo books. Um, and so, uh, so she has three um, different bodies of work. The first one is the one on her hometown and the effects of American culture on it. 
And when she shows that work, she, and they're black and white prints, there's 40 of them, and she shows it in a giant grid of the photos. It was also uh, made into a book. The, um, the one that I'm gonna show then is the apartment series. And so this is looking at the interiors of post-war housing in Tokyo. And I think that we very often, um, you know, we think about what Japan is like now and what Tokyo is like now. And while it's very crowded, we don't really think too much about how desperate things were um, post-war in Japan. There's, so not only was the established photo um, community upset with what she was photographing, but they were also upset with the look of her work. And so she actually taught herself by experimenting at home. She put a dark room in her house and she experimented and she was very interested in this kind of really roughness, very textured, very grainy. And if you think, you know, so back in the States, Ansel Adams is reigning supreme with, you know, no, no grain, uh, things out of focus, this sort of very gritty look. She liked the idea of the thought of a print being a physical object. Um, her third body of work was called Endless Night and that was on brothels. And then she did do another one where she revisited her hometown. Um, and this was a, a photograph from that. And you can really see the influence of Western culture. Um, she's one of the few people that I, actually she's the only person that I'm showing something much more contemporary. Um, so her very recent work is looking at the passage of time on bodies of work and the personal belongings of people. And because we had uh, talked a little about Frida, um, so this is Frida's um, corset on the right side and then her uh, leg and shoe on the left side. Okay, our next photographer is Flor Gardunio. And um, what I love about this self-portrait is you have this real sense of her spirit and this individual. And if you put your hands over, the, over her hands, it looks just like an average portrait. And then all of a sudden you see these fabulous uh, kind of costumes. And I think that that really um, shows an element of um, her love of mythology and the playfulness involved in her work. She had been at university uh, and uh, studying photography and left to assist Manuel Alvarez Bravo with his printing. Um, one of the first jobs that she got out after that time period was she was commissioned to illustrate uh, a series of school textbooks. And Basically, they would send her all around Mexico to very remote areas. And doing this work gave her the opportunity to, number one, get to really know her country. Um, number two, to develop her own kind of visual style. And um, she started really documenting and becoming very interested in the activities and costumes of the indigenous Indians which had a very strong impact on her work. And she really continued to explore um, Latin American themes and mythology, as well as there was this real, you know, kind of textural um, organic sensuality to the work as well. This uh, body of work is called Witness of Time and it was her first book um, that she did. This was one of my favorite images of hers. I, I love the sense of texture. It has an interesting reference to the previous one that we had looked at, but just this plate of the, the roofing and then the straw and then the hair. I just love that layer upon layer. And I can only imagine that the print is just astounding. Here we have, we do really see that reference, you know, this almost has a Diego Rivera aspect to it. So a, a real love of uh, these themes and the mythology. 
My next photographer then is Jeannie Matusamea Ash. And um, she uh, has several interesting bodies of work. I, I chose, and I would highly recommend that you see, she, her first series was actually on the Gullah uh, um, Islands, which are the series of islands just off of, um, I think it's, uh, let's see, what's that? South Carolina. Uh, and the Gullah language. So this is a group of people who really brought over their African traditions and have, uh, have meshed them then with their American experience. But the um, group that, the body of work that I wanted to show um, is her South Africa portfolio. And the reason I wanted to show that was, um, so she writes that growing up in America, a child of the 50s and 60s, I was born and raised on the south side of Chicago. My understanding of racism and caste was formed through living in that ethnically divided city, a reflection of both institutional and informational policies based on complexion. The south side of Chicago was in its own way, a form of apartheid. And so I thought that that was a very interesting way to kind of connect one's own experience with this thing that was happening across the world that you had connections and roots to. Um, so she did this series on, um, this is looking at the diamond mines. These are diamond workers. They're lockers. A seamstress. I love the um, calendar. I don't know if you can really see that. There's this great calendar up on the wall. This is um, looking at, so one of the things that, um, that they had in apartheid was these townships where you had an internal passport system. So this was a passport credential check. And this passport, you were not allowed to leave the township without your papers. And if you were found without your papers, you could be arrested and very likely you might not come back at all. Now, uh, Obviously, it's maybe you know her, maybe you don't. So she's Arthur Ashe's widow. Um, and her position, I think, gave her access to people that maybe the average American coming over uh, wouldn't have. This is Chief Butelezi. And then here we have uh, Bridget and Harry Oppenheimer, owners of a diamond mine. This is an image from that series on the Gullah and she has a terrific website, which I highly recommend um, that you take a look. This next photographer, now we're going from South Africa and we're going to Poland. So Zofia Radet has done this very interesting sociological record where um, beginnings, let's see, she began in 1987 and she died in 1997. Sorry, she, she began in 1978 uh, and died in 1997 and with her work undone, not finished. Um, and what she was doing was she was basically documenting um, portraits of inhabitants of towns and villages in, in mostly in Poland, uh, but, the, but the work kind of grew uh, the more that she worked on it. Um, she called it the cycle. So the cycle branched off and expanded in new directions. Um, by the time she passed away, she had actually uh, produced 16,000 negatives, many of which still haven't been printed or scanned. And so these are actually owned by, the work was given to the Polish, uh, to one of the Polish museums. And it's this amazing, um, uh, database where you actually have access to thousands of images. So I decided to narrow what this was really interesting with the two Kennedys over there in the corner. And I also decided to do interiors because I love seeing how people live and how they work. Our last photographer then 
Um, so like I said, I kept going down these, uh, down these rabbit holes where, okay, I think I have a group of photographers and then I'd learn about these other group and I'd wanna look at them more. And I kept going and my mom finally told me, you have to stop. At some point you have to end. So, um, but a couple of days ago, this image popped back in my head and I remembered it. So I had seen this in the eighties and um, it was shown to me by a terrific uh, teacher and photographer, Tim Bradley, who ran the photo department for a while at Art Center. And at the time he was a new teacher at Art Center, which was very establishment oriented and he was shaking the joint up. And so we kind of didn't know what to make of it. And so Flo had been doing street photography in New York in the 70s and 80s. And by this time, when she took this photo, she was actually completely blind. And what, made, what gave her the ability to return to the camera was autofocus. So that's a great example of gatekeeping that when this new technology comes down, all of a sudden a new group of people have a voice. And so she was talking about this and she said, you know, I was, I was sitting there and I knew that he was smoking and I'm, I can't remember now how she knew that the kid was sucking her thumb in the back. And she said, I just saw the picture in my mind and I took it and she called this one, everyone sucks. And for me, it just really like, it blew my mind because it was like, you don't need to see to take an interesting photograph. Um, and so, you know, I have to say that I just love her spirit. Um, but it also, I think what she did was she showed me that being a photographer is really how you see the world, not how your camera sees the world. That it, you know, it's something that happens in your mind. Um, and so she is still, she likes to call her, the, that she's interested in ironic reality. And, um, and she still takes photo. Unfortunately, she uh, was then diagnosed with MS. She's now com almost completely paralyzed and in a wheelchair, but she will direct friends and passerbys to help her take a photo. She's always been an advocate for the disabled. And she actually taught the first photography class for the blind um, at the Lighthouse International. Um, and I thought this would be, this is a perfect place to end because I think, you know, my hope is that I, I felt like, and I hope that you feel this too, like I got to have this community of women just surrounding me and encouraging me, all these people that, you know, kind of really took flight. And so, um, so I thought this would be a great place to end. I have one more slide and that is um, a list of resources for you. So, um, you know, obviously this was like an amuse bouche in terms of, uh, of tapping into this. Um, there's several really great things going on right now within the last year. The new women behind the camera, um, that's a new exhibition that is looking at that time period of the 20s through the 50s, has 120 international photographers. Emma Lewis, a curator over at the Tate Modern, has a terrific book, Photography of Feminist History, probably should be history. Um, and it had a wonderful timeline that I really enjoyed looking at. Uh, Dr. Deborah Willis also has a new book called Reflections in Black, A History of Black Photographers, 1840 to the Present. There is actually a film called Through a Lens Darkly, Black Photographers and the Emergence of a People. And that you can see for free. It's on that channel. It's called, is it Tubby or Tubi? I don't know how you pronounce it. Um, there's another one. There's a very interesting book uh, published by 10 by 10 photo books called What They Saw. And these are uh, photo books by women starting from 1843, that's our gal to 1990. Um, this weekend, I got recommended this last, this next one, Seizing the Light, A Social History of Photography by Robert Hirsch. Obviously, the Getty uh, is open to uh, research. 
And then there's a couple of great websites. The first one is called Aware Index. And they have this wonderful database of women artists. It's all kinds of art. And you can search by discipline, you can search by country, by time period, um, and they have just all kinds of different artists. And then the one I really loved was called 100 Heroines, which are these little blurbs. They're all women photographers. They have a whole historic area and then a, a set of contemporary ones. And then there's also, if you're interested in less historic ones, contemporary, there's a, a great website, uh, blackwomenphotographers.com. <sighs> okay. I think I made it. Oh my gosh. So uh, hopefully you haven't gotten totally uh, tired of hearing my voice. Well, you probably are tired. I'm tired. Um, but anyway, so uh, so what, I, what I'm hoping that you will do, and I would love for you to take a minute and just uh, type in, if you could type in just the name of somebody uh, a woman that was maybe somebody we don't know that was significant for you. I'm going to go ahead and put in uh, the first one and I'm going to, and then short sentence. Um, so mine, and I'm just because I'm the lecturer, so I get to grab a little more time. So uh, like I said, I was at Art Center in the 80s learning photography. It was me and a bunch of guys who wanted to shoot nudes on cars. It was a long, hard road. And they kept taking us to these photo studios with these guys that just were overblown egos. And I, I would look at them and I go, that ain't me, that ain't me. I just don't see it. I don't see the path I'm gonna take. And then we went to this amazing food photographer. Her name is Terry Friedman. She worked in LA, she may still be working. She had a lovely studio and she was like a normal person. And I just, and I loved her work. And so that for me was really encouraging. It, I thought if she can do that, that I can do that path. So I would love to see um, some people's names up here. So just send one out, just take a few moments and send them out. And then also, um, yeah, if you have a question, you could unmute and ask. Um, and if it's too tech for me, then I'll, I'll hand it over to an actual art historian. Okay, but thank you guys so much for, for listening through it. Wonderful, that was so interesting, thank you. Oh, I paid you to say that. Yeah, we'll have lunch tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Oh, Veda Bailey, I haven't heard of her. Nice. Sylvia Patch, I know the name, but I, I can't quite bring the work to mind. Yeah, it was really interesting. I kept doing research and, oh, Deborah Turberville, adore her work, absolutely. Um, is she still working, I wonder, Susan? Is she still, she can't be that old. She should still be around. I don't know, I thought she had died. I'll, I'll look her up. Okay, I yeah, she I she wow. was also, I was gonna put Sarah Moon on and, um, uh, but then I was like, okay, as you can see, I kind of ran long. So, and this ran a little longer than my actual test. So it, uh, yes, Fran, thank you, Sarah Moon. There we go. And let me just say that if you're in the Bergamot area at um, Peter Fetterman's gallery, when you walk in just to, you know how he has that little, there's a little hallway and a tiny little side room. In the little hallway, almost behind a door, there is this enormous, it must be like six foot by four foot Sarah Moon photo that looks like a John Singer Sargent painting. I thought at first it was a painting um, and I was so blown away. So let me just put a plug in for the Sarah Moon at Peter Fetterman's. Cool. Well, Cindy, you're more than, oh man, she died. Oh. I did love the reveals work. I thought she um, really did some interesting stuff. Uh, I wanna thank uh, Anne for an incredible presentation. It is a uh, ton of work putting these things together, the history series <laughs> with all those slides. And oh, I'm sensitive to that. Um, it takes a lot of time 
uh, to put these things together. But clearly, Anne has a passion and dedication for the art and the medium. And that shows in a terrific presentation. We got so many uh, complimentary posts in the chat about uh, how impressive uh, the presentation was tonight, Anne. Oh, so, oh thank you. Yeah. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so if there's just so many, you know, you, you realize it's like, well, what about these people? And, and then you felt like, okay, they're already underrepresented and now I'm cutting them out. So it just felt like, you know, you're already like, these people are already being tossed out and now you're tossing them out again. So it, you know, there was a lot of guilt going on there. <laughs> well done. Uh, very well done. Um, thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you, everybody. I really appreciate you coming and staying, and um, and I appreciate that you've been very sweet and supportive during this process. <laughs>